So, Namaste everyone. Welcome to our first session of Samskriti Gyan Mala, a series of talks which we have initiated with a view of developing and growing our understanding of what we refer as Bharatiya. Our today's speaker is Sri Neti Shiv Sagarji. He is an instrument engineer and he is a small scale industrialist for the last 20 years. He had a rich experience of working with Steel Authority of India and he has been a voracious reader, has a keen interest in Indian culture, different dharmic aspects of it, scriptures, etc. He would be exploring today the different aspects of culture, its importance and how it reflects in our day to day life. These first set of series of talks are with this purpose of developing a broad understanding of some key concepts. So here we would avoid dwelling into very deeper aspects of it. We would first try to get a big picture of all the fundamentals. And with that aim, we are starting the series. So with that, now we will start the, start the session. Sir, over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Modi. Respected and learned senior members, my brothers and sisters of the meeting. Today, I have been assigned to talk on the subject understanding culture, its components, its functions, and its significance in society. I was browsing the internet and searching some of the books which I have for a good definition or a good explanation of the word culture. I came across many explanations in the internet. I have picked up around three or four. I'll just read them. The first one is, it is a little bit more comprehensive. Culture refers to the cumulative deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, hierarchies, religion, notion of time, roles, spatial relations, concepts of the universe, and material objects and positions acquired by a group of people in the course of generations through individual and group striving. This is a bit long, but a little bit more uh, comprehensive. Then there is another definition. I picked up these definitions because each one of them have got a certain element unique for itself. The first one is general. The second one is the culture is a way of life of a group of people the behaviors, beliefs, values, and symbols that they accept generally without thinking about them and that are passed along by communication and imitation from one generation to the next. The third one is a little simpler but powerful. Culture is the habit of successful self-control. The fourth one is, is a bit modern. Culture is a collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from another. These are the four I have picked up, and probably my next few minutes talk dwells on each one of them. Before going to understand the culture in detail, we have to keep in mind the evolution of species has given us some capabilities and also has put some restrictions on us. One of the important properties of life is reproductive ability, reproductive nature. Insects, birds, and animals, including our humans, have been by nature divided into male and female categories. It is imperative that a member of one male group has to interact with a member of female group for affecting reproduction. This we cannot avoid. In contrast, Bacterium reproduces itself. There is no male bacterium or female bacterium. So there is no need of social life for bacteria. But for all other categories, higher categories like insects, birds, and animals, there is a social unit. The first basic social unit is a duo, that is a male female couple. Then immediately after that, reproduction and hence comes a family. That is the second higher unit. Now, a family unit is good enough if they want to make a day-to-day -day living. 
but when they have to face occasional natural calamities or otherwise protect themselves from the attacks from wild animals and all such occasions this family unit is insufficient they have to group little bigger units then came a herd or a tribe or a village or some such things once these social units have formed definitely there will arise some opportunities some responsibilities and some rights also unless there is a proper understanding between the members of that group small or big chaos will result so it becomes necessary a set pattern of rules norms etc have to be brought out and everybody has to follow it then only they will have a peaceful coexistence this effort of people to control or to coordinate among us themselves with a set pattern of rules can be called an effort of civilization civilization means people are made into civil that means if not made into civil we have to think that they will have a criminal attitude maybe a little too simplification but more or less so then these norms of behavior are these rules that are formed by the village or a tribe or anything mostly they may be formed over a period of time by the elders of the people to suit their environment or to suit their geography and other requirements so once these are formed then they have to be adhered to by all the people now comes the question we are all human beings we are all endowed with not only we even the animals are also endowed with senses the senses have a role in our living they have a specific purpose but the perceptions from the senses have uh, can give rise to pain and also pleasure of course pleasure we enjoy animals do enjoy but there is a difference between the sensual perception of animals and that of human beings the sensual perception of animals is relatively limited that is as to as per to the extent of necessities of life but for humans the sensual perception is much more than that that means we may develop a tendency to use these sensual perceptions for our pleasure or we may develop a sense of greed a lion hunts only when it is hungry it it allows a prey to pass by if it is not hungry so also other species but with us we try to accumulate as much as is available or we crave for it this attitude is the biggest hurdle in making the people adhere to the rules and regulations of the village or tribe or even a bigger unit now this has to be ensured that means adherence of the people or they should be cultivated a behavior to adhere to the norms this this is the primary function of civilization a civilization has got two instruments to effect this function one of them is a state and the other one is culture state is that function which uses fear and force so all the mechanisms involved in the state use this fear and force then culture is that mechanism it doesn't use fear or force it uses knowledge and faith now once somebody uses force a resentment will come in substance the state craft uses this fear and force the in substance whatever we have talked it comes the society needs some submission of all its members in following the rules and regulations set by the group now once we say the word submission resentment will come opposition will come nobody likes to submit themselves now to avoid this culture take took a little bit subtle method of inculcating this behavior of adherence to the norms and practices of the tribe or village 
Now, culture utilizes, as we told earlier, knowledge and faith. Now, let us see the knowledge portion. If all the members of the group acquire knowledge of the norms and traditions that they are expected to follow, their meaning and their necessity, then it's good, but it takes quite a bit of time. Even if they acquire all of that also, this human tendency, this human greed will be the biggest hurdle in their adherence to it. Even knowledgeable persons also could succumb to greed or break the rules. Then there is another problem. In a society, continuously members will join the society and members will go away also. People will bond, people will come into the society and people also will die. The new members, until they become knowledgeable of all these things, should we let them break the rules? That will be a problem. So now the question is, the culture has to take care of these new members and inculcate into them the behavior of adherence to the rules even much before they acquire the necessary knowledge. Now here also one more natural factor comes into force. Animals acquire their faculties much earlier than humans. A cop starts walking in a day or two, but a human infant takes about a year to start walking. So also faculties. So we cannot wait, our culture cannot let all the members to acquire the knowledge and follow it. Then what other method? The method is to use the faith. So we have to create a faith in them so that they adhere to the know, rules and traditions, even without knowing their importance and their necessity. This is what we do also. That is, we teach a, a infant of two years or three years how to brush the teeth without his knowledge of what is the necessity of brushing the teeth. So also many other things. So this is all the basic background of culture. Now, let us see the sum of all aspects, the way culture is what culture is, the sum of all aspects, the way that group behaves, what they think, what they wear, they, what they act, eat, like, celebrate, react, etc. All these things are composite and they form a culture. Now, this behavior or this attitude is to be inculcated into all the members from day one. For the, new, for the new members from day one or from early stages. So now they will learn by imitation. They will learn when they are taught. But one more thing is there. The society has to use the standard practice of carrot and stick policy. Now, what is carrot here? What is stick here? Now, there is a human tendency is we like appreciation. We like patting on our back. We like recognition. Now, that is the carrot part of it. Then stick policy is a frown from our elders, a rebuke from neighbors, or a dislike from other people is the stick. These two soft ways culture adopts in inculcating this confirmatory behavior in its new members. Now, it becomes necessary. A large group has to monitor this in all their new members. This cannot be done by the whole group or the, cult, the society has to develop a mechanism for it. Those mechanisms are building smaller groups like families, dynasty, full caste, region, professional, and all these things. These are all to monitor and apply softly the culture, culture methods. Now, traditions, customs, social functions, ceremonies are all designed for this purpose only. Society desires to live peacefully, conduct its affairs smoothly. It is possible if all its members adhere to the establishment, as we discussed earlier. Now, culture utilizes the soft aspects of these things to bring up the people and other things. Of course, culture is not static. This is all background we are discussing. The norms and practices may change may have to be changed according to the changing needs of the society and also according to the environmental influences also. Generally speaking, 
most cultures leave some scope for improvement and change changing times changing resources changing technologies technological advances many such matters will make it necessary for culture to change its cultural practices or to modify some of the cultural practices a group of people may get involved in finding the necessary modifications and suggesting them to the society and this this becomes necessary it is possible of course that a group of people may be under the leadership of a great man or a prophet carve out a culture in great detail with a lot of rules and regulations generate scriptures supporting such details and dogmated in the minds of the large group of people and commit them to continue it for generations to come such things are possible such things did happen in history also but such cultures over a period of time because they are dogmatic tend to be counterproductive to the humanity and eventually died out though for some period they may do a great harm to their society as well as to mankind in general this is one aspect which we have to keep in mind now by now we have almost explained all our definitions culture is some of all the ways the society thinks society eats society likes blah 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 this is our first definition the second definition is culture inculcates in its new members the adherence behavior before they start thinking about them this is the second point from the point from the second definition this also we discuss it culture is a mechanism to make its members control their greed for sensual pleasures to ensure adherence to set norms and practices this is the third definition culture is a sort of self control third our fourth point is culture is the collective programming of the mind of the society this is also we have seen totally culture culture definitely is not limited to a small group and we call culture only if it is pertaining to a larger group of course there could be subcultures now let us see what are the components of the culture now as we have discussed every aspect of life becomes the integral part of the culture and gets identified with the culture the way they talk the way they wear the way they interact with each other the way they behave with others or among themselves these are all integral part of the culture these are all the components of the culture the way they wear their apparel their jewelry the way they perform their ceremonies the way they treat their they deal that is also a part of the culture the way they treat their children and elders all these things are from various components of the culture and mostly we are all familiar with this one the way the music is developed in that group the way literature is developed in this group these are all the parts of the culture and we are all generally more familiar with all these things now let us see what are the functions of the culture i have identified four major functions probably some of them are repetition of the previous whatever i done but these are all the functions the first and foremost function is to inculcate among its members the habit of adherence to the norms and traditions of the society pride in their culture respect for their culture and importantly a commitment to protect the culture at any cost this is the first and foremost function of the culture the second and <coughs> more important function which is usually neglected is to review and evaluate its norms and practices against the changing needs of the society and against the impact of the external environment especially in view of the possibility of increased interaction with other cultures as is now happening the society has to be very vigilant about the soft and hard attacks on its culture from its own enemies too much stubbornness or too much vacillation in changing norms and practices will dilute the culture and eventually destroy it examples of this can be cited <laughs> sanatan dharma sanatan cultures refused to take 
Muslim converts back into Sanatan Dharma in time, in proper time, is one of them. Similarly, refusal to introduce English medium in schools, which are predominantly oriented towards Sanatan culture, is one another. Like that, so many are there. However, one must be careful. These are all very delicate issues to be handled very carefully. So I don't want to go much detail into each one of them. The third most important function of the culture is to educate as many as its members about the greatness of the culture, even though many of them appear to be adhering to it. There is always a danger or a scope for weak minds to be drawn out of the culture. A very powerful enemy for culture is the concept of individualism and every individual's right of defining his own style. This concept works against the culture and this will be working continuously in the culture. So the forebearers of culture has to keep this in mind. The fourth function of the culture is to define the scope and restrictions on the interaction of its members with the members of other cultures. Especially, this is more important now when because the members of one culture are sometimes necessarily have to live in the societies which are following a different culture. So, what their role will be, what their role should be, and to what extent they can you know, take lenience. These are all to be defined by the parent culture and make them know or teach them. This is also this is the fourth function. These are the four functions which are identified by the culture. Now, who will do this one? Culture itself does it. Culture is such that culture cultivates. The name culture or the word culture involves cultivating. Cultivating is a conscious effort by the society. That means it is the culture of the society which cultivates the culture. This is, there is nobody else to do this one. Culture is such. Now, let us see the significance of the culture in a society. Now, <coughs> once we understand the function or function or the background of the culture, the significance is more or less obvious. Can there be a society without a culture? Can we imagine a society without any culture? This, this is practically chaotic society. It will be chaos society. That means there is no culture. Then what is left out? Civilization will have to depend only on the first instrument, that is state. Then state has the responsibility. State will have the responsibility to define all the norms and rules. And obviously, state uses force and fear only. So that means there should be a huge mechanism, huge monitoring mechanism to look after this one. And this will become unwieldy. So this, there is an American author by name Ayn Rand who had discussed this situation in her book called Anthem. So she describes a society where there is no culture, only state will be there. There is everybody is there will there will be no name for individuals there will be only a number everybody will be identified by a number because name itself is a distinguishing from another that is why that is also taken out a complete uniformity and there will be big brother watching who is the big brother finally it will become a holy state and finally it will destroy itself a cult a society without a culture or a state without a culture cannot be Imagine. But the reverse of it, is it true? Can there be a culture without a state? Of course, yes. There can be a culture without a state. If all the members start adhering to the norms and practices of that culture voluntarily and fully, what will be the role of the state? To a large extent, the role will be very, very limited. We may imagine a group of people, fully cultured people, but without an estate. Of course, there are some references to such a state in two or 
to almost opposite speeches. Many of our scriptures of Sanatan Dharma, like Mahabharat and other scriptures, refer to what is called Satya Yuga, where Dharma, the cow of Dharma, was moving on four legs. At that time, there is no state, there is no necessity of Raja. Everybody was following Dharma. Of course, this may be utopian, we don't know. Similarly, in the communist documents also, they refer to what is called wither away state. They say, once the proletariat dictatorship has been established perfectly, then the function of state withers away. That is what they say. Anyhow, these are all the, the former one with a long back story and is less likely to reoccur in near future. And the latter one is somebody's wishful thinking only. These are all the things about culture. And in all this talk, which I have made now for this last 15 20 minutes, I have taken mostly Western concepts. I have not taken much of the what we call Oriental or Eastern concepts. And all these Western concepts have some advantage that they deal with only a couple of millennia, maximum at 2000 years, in which recorded history is reasonably available. But whether all these fundamentals or all these concepts hold good, when we have to talk about a society which is 15,000 years old or 20,000 years old or even 50,000 years old, I'm not sure. Probably some of the concepts may not hold good, or we may have to redefine the concepts. So this is, in a nutshell, what I could make out. I had made a, I mean, to make this small presentation, I have depended mostly on one book, that is, that book is Our Culture. It was a series of three lectures given by Chakravartala Rajagopalachari in somewhere around 1950s. This was published by Bhavan's uh, oh, group, Bhavan's journal and Bhavan's group. So this book gives a very good introduction of the culture, its nature and other things. Of course, that book gave much more information and it talked about our Indian culture, which I have avoided because my topic is about culture, not specifically Indian culture. Probably in our subsequent topics, we may come across those concepts of Indian culture or various aspects of Indian culture. This is all what I wanted to share with you. Now, I give it back to Mr. Vivek Modi to conduct further session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, sir, for such a comprehensive take on culture, its different functions, and its significance. Now we will open it for a free discussion and question and answer. I would invite uh, any of the honorable member who would like to submit uh, his or her views for about three to five minutes and uh, also would like to invite questions in this regard. So anybody who would like to speak, if you could just raise your hand, there's a raise hand option, you see, so that I can call upon the names in a sequential way. We have also, I have just posted the link in the chat box of the book, which uh, Sri Sagarji just mentioned. This is the link uh, available, the book is available on Amazon. So I have just posted the link. Okay. Uh, Sai Jamalpur and uh, uh, I think that's, that's it. I worked with one of the multinational companies uh, in pharma sector. And that is where my question is also related to. Uh, See, when we are talking about culture, uh, there is a hum I mean, as corporate employee, as a, I have, I am divided into two parts right now. One where I live my office life, where there's a separate element of culture that is being introduced to me. One is which I get through my roots, uh, through parents and, you know, say the society that I interact with outside my office. Now, do you see any risk of amalgamation of these two cultures and how do we bring out these common elements that is one question and how do you retain the roots because we we are not trained the same way 
how our parents treat us or how our parents are teaching us office treats us differently they say you know you have to be uh, mindful of uh, cultures from us or uh, uh, europe and all that based on where the location of the country is or, or the company is right they they never talk about localization of the culture and how it goes but whereas we see in other countries irrespective of where they are from say for example china or any other place we are seeing you know they they follow their own culture and then they stick to it even within the company but for us in india we are taught european culture we are taught us culture we are taught all sorts of things uh, through our uh, office modes uh, so how do we look at that and how do we how do you think one culture can be preserved uh, um as compared to others i enough first question and thank you sai uh, who would like to answer sir uh, shri sagar ji or anybody else also can take the question right yes now one of the functions of the cultures is uh, i have given my fourth function is this only as a matter of fact in the changing environment when people have to work in areas where they are surrounded by people of other cultures what norms they have to follow this the society at large has to devise and such a mechanism at present is lacking in our society because you are referring to our indian context of course my lecture so my presentation was mostly generalized thing i did not specifically restrict to the indian context of sanatan dharma so that is why i have not covered those aspects in great detail probably in our circuit so this has to be looked by the culture who wants to preserve itself so unless i guide them my society guides it. society means what the elite in the society have to guide you and me i may not be having a ready answer for it and you are striving as an individual against such uh, things you probably use your yeah. so this is all we are all trying we have been encountering such situations uh, but one thing i would like to this is we unfortunately are we can express in our culture in india for various reasons we all know the reasons once we assert ourselves in general not specifically talking to you in your office you may be a specific case but with once we express in general then the awareness among other cultures about our behavior will come and they will correct themselves why they are not doing in china why they are not doing in other things why not they, they are not doing in saudi arabia the same europeans the same americans when they go to saudi arabia they will have follow all the rules dictated by the country why because there is this in india we are trying to build up our uh, self role is also that we are trying to build up that we have to make our people adhere to our culture probably we may have to define our culture also now because of the long gap we have come across to such situations that is it. okay pass awesome. on muted from my side see what i would like to say is uh, this uh, is a very pertinent question <laughs> what sai has asked so for the reason for that is because uh, our country we are all uh, still uh, having the colonial mindset which is why even all our corporate companies everybody is following that still just now we are beginning to wake up and seeing the importance uh, and uh, realizing our own culture so i think slowly just like uh, he said uh, in china they follow their own culture even in corporate companies and all that i think in a once uh, uh, over a period of time the same thing will happen in india also as india rises economically and um, it becomes more stronger and we get out of the colonial mi mindset i think this will happen uh, here also sooner or later uh, it's a very <coughs> important question and a relevant question raised by shai see the your question itself has the answer actually you said we are expected to respect the various cultures now the same will be told to the people sitting in america also they also have to respect the various cultures with which they come across in the course of their jobs it means these companies have accepted each country can have its own culture and it also wants to respect that culture and you try to give respect to that feeling opinion don't try to ride roughshod over them that's what it means so the corporate companies cannot survive working in various countries if they want to ride roughshod over the cultures of that country 
you understand so therefore you need not have to worry it only says suppose somebody has a particular type of uh, dressing you just respect that's that their child you need not dress like that you dress the way you want to dress in your culture he is not asking you to dress like that he is asking it's a mental phenomenon what they are trying to refer to is mostly a mental phenomenon in terms of values and opinions but in this context right now what is very relevant and important is we are on the topic of culture it will there will be another occasion where we will deal, deal very elaborately on that what is known as a cultural marxism that is sweeping across the country america actually now in and america i am studying this subject a bit deeply to prepare a paper on that uh, to be used by our vigyan uh, pravah you know vigyan pravah people important thing is that this is the intention of this cultural marxism in one way is to destroy all the existing systems and bring some sort of anarchy american systems are resisting it for instance in 20 countries 20 states in america have banned talking about race in the schools so i have collected which are the states which have banned all these things and what is that that they have banned because otherwise what they are fearing is now the at the political level the cultural marxism is supported by the present dispensation the democratic party which has also assimilated little bit of marxism so called liberalism uh, rights uh, attitudes various shades of opinions among civil rights movements all those things are part of the democratic system the republican party which is slightly conservative is opposing this totally so it boils down to how politically they fight it so they are fighting it on political front also in this country right now so cultural marxism has also incorporated the muslim elements into them to become politically strong minorities into them to become politically strong so when we are trying to be about it actually uh, one example that i can cite is my own son he was working in facebook as a manager no the local environment ethos system was to sort of imbibe this type of cultural marxism and its components after waiting for some time he left that company and joined some other company he said i will not be able to compromise on myself and my value system to work in this company because it is facebook i will not work so he resigned and joined another company so this can happen why mentioning is people friends some of them are working in the corporate uh, environment once you are very strong on you sometimes you know if the what your boss talks about it what your superiors uh, peers talk about it you have to carefully negotiate the environment in which you are located by by protecting yourself it's a survival uh, struggle it is a struggle for survival in a way it is a what you call a passive way of invading our minds that's what is happening so let us be careful about that thank you thank you sir so sai if i can summarize the three i think bottom line comes while we accommodate and respect other culture we must learn and from that understanding assert ourselves our culture uh, without any uh, shyness about it and uh, that would probably help so uh, hopefully that uh, gives you some answer yes sai okay anybody else has uh, anything to say or any other question to ask you can raise your hand raise your hand means in the in the google meet there is the option of raising hand because if your camera is off i cannot see your raised hand okay so by the time others prepare for a question i have a question sir and i would like uh, shri sagar ji and mama ishara ji to take it the the question is uh, we say that in india we have uh, different varieties um, uh, like uh, the way we dress the way we eat uh, even our way of worship etc within the umbrella of uh, uh, hinduism itself so we see uh, the differences but even after that we say our culture is our identity so if we take those components of culture which comes with language or clothing or rituals or uh, food etc then uh, there is a huge uh, variety but still we say that it is uniting so i would like to know what is that cultural aspect which unites us what is that thread i would like to add that this is a bit complicated question 
and probably needs a lot of study. But one thing about a nation and about a culture is it's more of a feeling. Civilization is internal. Culture is external. Culture exhibits the behavior of the people, their dresses, they do everything. But seeing that, we have to find out to what civilization or what background for that one is there. If we say that the people dress like this, they talk like this, they do like this, okay, that is for categorization, it's okay. But what is the bottom line behind it? What is the central theme behind it? Does it have a central theme or it is just like that they pick up one type of dress, one type of this one and that? It's not so. But in mean, all the talk which I told, because that is basically a Western concept, actually, it did not tell about the central theme on which this is to be based. Only I covered it or it covered it under the word civilization. So civilization, how it will be formed just like people how they want to live together. And then they set set a norms they are set. Actually, I have not gone into depth, much depth actually, unless we define the for all cultures or even for that matter for all civilizations what that particular group feels about creation about evolution about life after death about the existence of a almighty or all such things are not explained or not brought out you cannot categorize civilization or culture culture has a bottom line in this one but western concepts normally relegate these concepts to a corner and they don't normally stress on that one because they have an anathema to all these things but these are all the things and most of them are unsubstantiated nobody can substantiate the existence of almighty or many such things but the culture as well as this nation both of them are more of a feeling that feeling so if the group have got the same that feeling irrespective of whether they wear same type of dress or same type of this or same type of behavior or same type of language etc or if they have different also you can call them same culture same nation these words are very, very interrelated, culture and nation. You can separate them in a thin line. So this is more of a gut feeling. And if we have the same gut feeling, and if we have same some of the same practices, which are basically fundamental. And that is why we say, when we say unity and diversity, some of the aspects which will bring out normally from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, everybody takes so, Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, all these nadis, Sanirin Kuru, and many such things. Same Vonkaram is like this, some of this. They have underlying meaning. The way you dress, you made a bush shirt I started wearing from the last couple of years, so I'll change right now. Does it mean that I have changed everything or my culture has changed? Till two years back, I was wearing only pants and shirt. So these are all external aspects. Of course, because we see them, we try to categorize them. But the underlying concept, whatever is there, that is very important and if that is same we have to call them the same culture in respect of differences in their attire language this and that thank you sir i'll just add to what uh, cheer sagar has uh, elaborated <clears throat> in bharatanatyam by that uh, yogi bharatas natya shastram there is one sloka, sloka I do not remember at the moment. But what it says is, when you depict a drama on the stage, how the stage has to be built is narrated in that. He says, across the country, although you have different forms, dance forms, which we call them as says, across the country, the approach to the stage is same. So like that, as Sagar has pointed out, we have to dwell upon understanding what are those common elements which are influenced by the mind, spirit and the mind, not so much by the external appearance of the dress. Dress is related to the environment. Hood also is related to the environment to some extent. And the natural resources available there. In our country, vegetarianism is not a taboo across the country. But in USA also now it is slowly becoming, you know, the vegan culture has come now. Respecting vegetarian food and all that. 
they are realizing the importance of this vegetarianism in the uh, health aspects also. Now, our people have told us the health aspects about vegetarianism in the Shastra, Charaka Samhita and other things. How vegetarianism, actually the intestines are not designed for non-vegetarian food is what the science says. Therefore, when we are talk of that unity of the culture across the country, there are certain elements or practices or beliefs or values which are common across the country. There are certain externalities. Sometimes what we call as culture, we are, we are stopping by looking at the externalities. You use a person, he's a highly cultured person. We would have used this word. When you use the word, he's a highly cultured person, we are not referring to his dress. We are referring to his behavior, his behavioral aspects. His behavior is so nice, so appealing to the elders, to the children, to the peers. The way he uses his language in a very respectful manner when he addresses others. The way he expresses without offending others. Without offending others, how to express? You have to learn from Hanuma, Lord Hanuma, from Ramayana. How he talks. We were told when we were in the offices, one small element of the Muslim culture. The attender comes to you, let us say I am sitting in the office. Attender comes to you and tells you, Saab ne aapko yaad kiya. My senior is sitting elsewhere. He asked me, he asked about me or inquired about me. The attender has to come and communicate to me. You now he has to do the balancing between my boss and myself. So he says, Saab ne aapko yaad kiya. So that is putting it in a very fine manner, not offending the feeling of either of them. So language reflects the culture. Not which language, every language has these elements. Language as a, as a script has evolved over a period of time. Every language you will find these fine sentiments. So when you say across the country there are different things, suppose the impact in the northeastern areas from the beginning, to other elephant elements might be so strong there the non vegetarian element is much more. I visited uh, Manipur and other places it's about a year back. So you find it difficult, extremely difficult to cook, get vegetarian food. But we explained to the I explained to the chef how to prepare a vegetarian food by taking some vegetables. So he did it. There was no necessity, so it was not there. Practice is not there. But here you notice that here when you go to a restaurant. When I ask for a vegetarian food, I take vegetarian food without onion, garlic also. It's much more rigorous for me. You know, they understand this in a different manner because they are sensitive to allergies. So interprets, if they put this onion or garlic, I'm allergic to it. It can mean, you know, lawsuits and other things for them. So therefore, they respect your requirement and do exactly as per that faithfully. The way he interpreted my requirement is different. The way I ask him to do it, it doesn't matter, but the output is same. So that's how it is, it sort of, you know, it changes. So we have to understand the fine aspects of these things slowly, and then we can keep on listing them down. It, 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 I'm, I'm sure it's available, a lot of these things, you know, uh, sort of, you know, has already listed them down. Uh, Ramurthy has posted this. Nivedita uh, Bhide from Vivekananda Kendra, she has written a book about our culture. So we, we can get this information slowly compile as part of one of our exercises. People can take and you know have a brainstorming session in one of our Bhyas uh, Vargas or in one of one, one, one of those Saturdays. And just let them listen. You know, in one exercise when we did the all pin that we use for putting papers together, in a management exercise, we were given a group and the Conduct, the director gave and gave us the wall pin. Then he said, list down the uses of this. We listed down 27 uses of that. But he came back and told us there are 64 uses. So you, the mind, you know, keep on stretching the mind. You start getting new ideas how to do that. So we can do that. So I think uh, essentially the there is a commonality apart from the external appearances. There is commonality of thinking values 
and other things you know which are readily uh, seen you, you don't find a stranger when i talk to a person who is speaking hindi why why do i feel like that i don't feel like a stranger talking to anybody coming from assam why do i feel like that because we have been talked we have been told all, all of us are one we may have a different language a uh, different pant and shirt or you know external wear but internally we are all made of one substance that substance is explained in different ways and different languages called spirituality adhyatmikata you know um, physical culture or you know other things so we can open this that there are others two others have raised their hands choudhury yes, and also balu nagras let's go to them yes sir yes sir uh, dr choudhury ji you wanted to say i will have a brief question for the last uh, two decades one theme which was very Uh, much debated and was in strong fo- public focus was the clash of civilizations, and I just wanted to uh, know the difference between the clash of civilizations and clash of cultures. But anyway, subsequently, since Sagar ji explained it, that's why I withdrew my hand anyway. But now we have, you asked me that. One more thing I would like to just uh, observe here is that when we talk of civilizations, you know, normally in the terms Islamic, Hindu, Asian, European civilizations, they come to the mind, but in terms of the clash of cultures i would like to be give an example of the french people versus the american people it is the french people who vehemently resist all americanism though their civilization roots in america they have taken from the europe and probably more or less similar yet the ways their particular cultural ways are strongly resented by people so there is some funda- a difference between the civilizational values and the cultural values that's what i was thinking and maybe we need a little more nuanced education on this also that's all thank you actually namaster namaste vivek ji namaste sir namaste prasanna sir the uh, in terms of definition the textbook definition the civilization is the material part of that culture and the non material part of the culture is uh, that is the values faith belief etc are considered as culture so uh, as far as uh, bharat is concerned we have uh, we consider that uh, those people who pray similarly and those people who consider the land as mother these are the two common things whether it is uh, Uh, Assam or uh, Arunachal Pradesh or Kerala or uh, Kashmir or Telangana, we have Samudra Vasne Devi Parvata Sthana Mandali Vishnu Patni Namastu Priyam Padas Parshakshama Swami. This is common everywhere. And uh, Himalaya Kiritini that also is common everywhere. Everybody feels that Bharat Mata, the the way the uh, the mother is, that that feeling of being together is there. Apart from that, we also have. हम लोग जब प्रातस्मरण में हम लोग प्रातस्मरण में जिन जिन व्यक्तियों को हम पुराण पुरुषों को हम लेते हैं, all of us feel that they are our people. Whether it is whether they are from one place or the other place, it doesn't matter. We feel that they are all part of the same place. So that is what binds here, uh, in spite of the changes in language and changes in uh, eating, changes in uh, dressing. so we enjoy uh, that part not only that we have uh, been having cultural tourism that means uh, we have been touring across this nation very very frequently sadiyon se shankaracharya ke pehle se bhi yahan se wahan wahan se yahan jana hai aur wo bhi hamara hi samajhna ye bhi hamare log hi samajhna this is part of our uh, our cultural nationalism which sang all sang believes or which all of us in sang believe so in that context uh, what what is common to us is that couple of other points which came up earlier i'll take couple of minutes only one is the when two cultures join one completes it completely integrates completely becomes part of the other is called as assimilation that means there is no difference they also are sometimes they retain some aspects and they also uh, Take some other aspects, which is called as integration. That means, I have some things, and you have some things. That is integration. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come up. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come up. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come up. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come up. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come up. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come up. And the last version is the isolation, which very rarely has come
Nehru and Vary Railway have together promoted, which is isolating the tribes from the mainstream or the from each other also. So that brings up uh, the uh, one-upmanship or spirit of uh, intolerance or fighting. So those things come up, and that is why we have the issues in Manipur or any other place in Northeast, whether it is Nagaland, Mizoram, other places. So to usko handle karne ke liye slowly we need to integrate. Assimilation is the final part where we become one. There is no difference. But integration is the intermediary, or you know, it also continues to be one of the ways by which two cultures, when they meet, they live together and uh, they accommodate each other. So those are the points which I want to share. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, sir, now uh, now that uh, we are about to come to the closer uh, of this session uh, i i would like to have a a brief about let's say if some sanskriti foundation uh, karyakarta is dealing with uh, a student and student has this simple question what is great in our culture why should we follow uh, why why can't i because they have a limited understanding uh, what would you suggest what kind of answer would you suggest for a youth today who may not have the depth and the understanding of these nuanced ideas what should be the best way to at least nudge them and initiate a right process uh, we need your guidance on that anyone can think feel free yeah okay uh, one is uh... It's a very important point on which we should have clarity. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, one is uh, if somebody is trying to follow other culture, put him that question: Why are you following others' culture, leaving behind your culture? What is that you found great in the other culture? Now he will he will tell you if he has understanding it. He will tell you certain things. But anyway, you have to come back to say about what your culture to convince him. You have to come back to that. You say that unless there was something great in this country, something sustainable in this country, we would not have withstood the invasions that it had faced. The invasions we are talking about normally are the Muslim invasion and later British. But the invasions have started from Alexander time onwards. Actually, Vishwanatha Satchanarayana Ji, Kavi Samarat, who is a uh, John Peter Wadi, he has written 12 books in Telugu novel, in the shape of a novel. Purana Vaira Grantha Mala, that is the series name. I did not have the occasion to read these books earlier, but this time when I came here, I purchased those 12 books and brought them here and read them. You know, he narrated the story of how this country started uh, withstanding the aggressions, withstanding the other cultures, other peoples, bringing their philosophy into this, trying to wipe out our philosophies, our approaches. How various things have done that. So all these people, he defined them as opposing Puranas, opposing our philosophy and other things. Now it goes back to about two to 3,000 prior to Christ. So the whole process has started he has taken historical events, narrated them as a novel, so that you know people like us very easily understand it. We read a novel much faster than a uh, philosophical book. Mm -hmm. So he used the novel as a medium to convey his ideas. So what we have to tell the youngsters is, this country has in, in it certain basic elements, which were able to withstand the rigors of Muslim invasions, Christian conversions, and all those things. But still, we retained it. Maybe we had some rub off effect on them, but we still retained our core culture. This is what Arvind says. We retained that. We were not unified politically, but we are unified culturally. This is what Arvind also says. So, therefore, that, that is not in doubt. So, these aspects now, what is that strength which has kept us together? Respecting certain common values, respecting certain philosophical approaches. Like, for instance, if you ask a Christian, 
why should you lie love thy neighbor love thy neighbor is what is a statement in bible why do you have to lie lie love thy neighbor a christian has no answer but we have an answer because i do not see a difference between him and me the same atma prevails in both of us i have every reason to respect him love him not only he everybody else in the country in the world i go much much beyond the neighbor so this is what is taught to us philosophically why do i have to respect somebody else it's because internally it is the same atma which is flowing therefore i am not different from him for material purposes he has a different name for getting an aadhar card he has got a different name but putting on basing on what the resources the parents are able to provide yes some schooling and other things things like that but these are common right okay we can go on but then yes a brief brief approach that would be good enough because without touching the sustainability of this system of living we call is indian culture bharatiyata at its sustainability over the millennia withstanding the invasions test of time yes uh, yeah it stood the test of time communism has come communism is going the communism original philosophy basing on economic production now they found it is not yielding results they gave it up and now they are calling it as cultural marxism mm -hmm. soft approaches it's yes. a new way the same culture marxist converted into cultural marxist in germany and the philosophy started flowing from germany to other countries okay i'll stop here chair sagar wants to say something now i just want to add uh, in the talk also i have given the individualism or my right my freedom to do anything is the biggest threat to any culture for that matter not only our culture to any culture because culture involves in our adherence to the set norms not that the norms are very great in every respect yes whatever mahasrodi told some of them are great but not that every thing what we do in sanatan dharma is great to the extent that we have for no but even then we have to follow it because then only a little bit of uniformity let us the people come and one more thing is that self control part if i don't follow it for a particular practice or a particular ceremony i don't follow it why i don't follow it i have to prove to the society my peers my everybody that there is something basically wrong in that one or it is obsolete or it is this one not but i will get a selfish interest in that one that we have to we should not allow yes changes of the practices changes of the tensions is allowed they can be there they will be there also but change towards my interest change because of my western interest is to be prohibited so i have to stick to the world one only until it is changed by by whom by elite without self interest this used to be done one thing which i did not cover in that one because we have not i have not covered this one sanatan dharma is the the concept behind the kumbh mela once in every 12 years all the elite of the society join together he is only to take a review of it and redefine some of the practices if necessary and convey them back to the entire world and they will come without any invitation the time is fixed nobody needs to appointment or anything like that it is that such a practice must have evolved must have been evolved with a great effort only otherwise it will come now you convert like this people so so many things will come there nobody thinks come for no no question of change of date or anything it is celestial it will come and on that day they will come here to the ganga and once they come here they will be there there will be discussions there will be problems brought there and there will be some decisions by people who do not have any western interest whatsoever such people not somebody some raja here or some samrat there and they, those people will go back with the new definitions or new norms and other things and percolate them in the society so such practices have evolved or such practices were there so this individualism is biggest enemy as a matter of fact now many of the youth they they are only for individualism not that they find something wrong or anything of course they may tell some cock and bull stories picked up from the api dharma rao or somebody somebody like that so this is also which we have to be careful and we have to corner them there only so that they will come to senses thank you right sir thank you so much sir so individualism is uh, one thing and uh, the test of time these two things are important aspect to be looked into while answering uh, the youngsters 
So uh, here we come at the close. I would also make an announcement about our next session uh, before I summarize. So our next session is on 7th of September. If most of you who have a Gmail ID already with us given, uh, you would see in your calendar, it is already mentioned 7th of September, that is Thursday again, 8.25. Our next Samskriti Gyan Mala session number two, which will be taken by Honorable Chairman Sir, Uma Maheshwar Ravji. And uh, our topic would be Dharma and its distinctness from religion, a philosophical perspective. The format would be same. I invite uh, uh, the suggestions, learning from this first session. It is a beginning. So if there is any improvement to be made, uh, kindly uh, you can write to me in the WhatsApp so that I can incorporate all the worthy uh, suggestions. And with that, I would like to thank uh, Sri Shagarji for a comprehensive take on today's topic of culture. In fact, it was first time I got into that angle of culture where you started right from a bacterium, then to a duo, to a family, to a social unit, and then rise of responsibilities and rights, and that forms a norms, and then the civilization and culture shapes in. And then this distinct uh, feature of state versus culture, if we are guided by state, it is fear and force. And if we are guided by culture, it would be knowledge and faith. And that itself creates a lot of uh, aspects of the way we, we live. So that was uh, quite uh, an enlightening for me personally. And then uh, four major functions, I think that was well put. Uh, that also gives us clarity uh, about inculcating habit to adhere to the norms and then uh, uh, review and evaluate and then educate about it and then assert it, uh, if I just put it in a very crisp way. So, uh, and then some of the very pertinent questions on that. I think uh, uh, it was a good first session for all of us to dwell onto these important areas of our understanding of culture. And uh, uh, with, with this, uh, I would conclude this session. We will close with Shanti Mantra. We have our youngest member of the family here, Sri Vidya. Sri Vidya ji, you are listening to me? Yes, sir. So Shanti Mantra today you would do. We will close with Shanti Mantra. Sarve Bhavanti Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhavani Pashyantu Aap Sukkabhagavi, Shanti Shanti Shanti.